Let's take a look now at the main competing theories to the expectation theory of dreaming. All right, now, the theory that dominates the field at the moment is the theory of the professor of psychiatry at Harvard University called the activation synthesis theory. Hobson and McCarley originally developed the theory, but Professor Hobson is, McCarley's long since gone out of the picture, and Hobson, Alan Hobson, is the one, is the, is the scientist who promotes this theory, and it's the most widely accepted theory in the field of dream research, psychiatry, and psychology. This theory states quite simply that dreaming is the result of a random barrage of signals called the PGO spikes, and that is a random barrage of stimulation reaching up to the cortex to activate the cortex every so often to keep it ready for action. And that in the REM state, this would occur because the growing cortex needs to be stimulated. So that was his theory, and it's called the activation synthesis because the brainstem is activating the cortex. And those random signals start to fire off in the memory systems, etc. And the brain synthesizes the random signals, and we get these bizarre things called dreams. And the reason they're bizarre is because it's a random activation of the brain, just keeping the cortex stimulated. This theory is untenable for several reasons. The first reason why it's untenable is that if you wake people up in the middle of a dream, they go back and complete the dream. Dreaming is not random. Dreaming is about completion of patterns, and if you stop the patterns being completed, the person always goes back and completes the pattern. It is not a random signal. People have a need to complete the patterns. Also, we can show that dreams contain meaningful patterns that are pattern matches to waking metaphors, so they can't be the result of a random synthesis. We can even predict dreams, so they're not a random synthesis. Alan Hobson would maintain that there is no underlying structure to a dream. What you see is what you get. It's just a random synthesis. But what really blows this theory out of the water is the PET scan. The dreaming brain has now been scanned in PET scans. And, the, and what those PET scans images of the dreaming brain show, that it isn't a random barrage of the cortex. It is very selective parts of the brain that are activated in dreaming. In fact, most of the cortex isn't activated in dreaming. It's just the occipital cortex which synthesizes images. And apart from that, what's activated in dreaming is the expectation circuit in the brain. Exactly as the expectation theory of dreaming predicts, it is the expectation circuit in the brain that is activated in dreaming. Alan Hobson is furiously writing papers trying to explain, oh, well, maybe dreams are meaningful after all. Maybe what's actually happening is that there are certain habitual pathways in the brain and so that our concerns might be somehow more likely to be represented in our dreams than just random stuff, etc., etc. But what you're doing is adding hypothesis after hypothesis to the original theory. And once you start doing add-ons to theories, it shows the theories are not right in the first place. There's something fundamentally wrong with the hypothesis. But what, is, what has come back to life, though, is Fry's theory. There's a particular neurophysiologist who's also a psychoanalyst called Professor Solomons. I think he's in the University of South Africa now. He was at London University. And he has been trying his damnedest to bring Freudian theory, dream theory, back to life. Because he says that these PET scans support Freud. And in a way, they do support Freud, insofar as it is clearly the emotional brain that's been activated. So he says, since it's the emotional brain, and Freud's theory says, dreams are about emotions that have been repressed from childhood, etc. This supports Freud's theory. And in a kind of way, it does. However, if you look at Freud's theory, Freud's theory is based upon wish fulfillment. Freud's theory says that dreams are the fulfillment of wishes. And mostly dreams are painfully, not the fulfillment of wishes. They're full of anxiety and they're full of misery and the last thing on earth you'd be bloody wishing for. And consequently, Freud has to invent all this very convoluted theory about repressed sexual urges that are expressed through symbolism. But in fact, when we look at dreams, including Freud's dreams, we can see that they are perfect pattern matches for the stuff he was worked up about when he was awake. So his theory falls down on those grounds. His theory also falls down on Freudian theory in that it's not applicable to animals. His theory also falls down in that the, um, the expectation theory of dreaming is a far better fit to the PET scan data than wish fulfillment, because it is the expectation circuit that's activated, not the wish fulfillment circuit. Expectations can be either negative or positive. And that's why we have anxiety dreams, because our expectations were anxious, our expectations were sexual, our expectations were angry. And that's why we have these dreams. It's quite straightforward. So that's the, the, uh, that's the second theory that's being 
tempted to be resurrected at the moment, but it simply is not as good a fit for the data. The third theory that's getting a little prominence at the moment is that dreaming exists for memory consolidation in the brain. What the data overall show is that both slow wave sleep and dream sleep is necessary for memory consolidation. Not just dream sleep, but both slow wave sleep and dream sleep facilitate memory consolidation in the brain. And that is exactly what we would expect to happen from expectation theory of dreaming. Because if you're learning something new, you're going to have a lot of false starts. So you're going to have a lot of incompleted expectations. If you can then deactivate those false starts in dreaming, that then leaves the real learning to be consolidated. So we would expect some enhancement of memory as a result of acting out the false expectations. So the fact that some memory consolidation is involved in dreaming is no more than we'd actually expect with the expectation theory of dreaming. So that is no way a threat to the expectation theory of dreaming. If a hypothesis is actually really, really true, if it actually does describe how reality functions, then you would expect it to have important consequences in the real world. You would expect things, to, you would expect it to be able to explain other phenomena, to be connected to other phenomena. You would expect to be able to get results from it. Inevitably, when some piece of truth is discovered, it has effects and impacts upon the real world. It connects to other things, it explains other things, we can do things as a result of it. So if the expectation theory of dreaming is true, you would expect that it would throw light in many areas of human psychology. You would expect it would have practical uses, because that's inevitably what you find. Truth turns out to have practical uses. But what we'll see is with the expectation theory of dreaming, it explains phenomena that hitherto have been utterly inexplicable. But it's going to explain things connected to hypnosis, the first scientific theory of, uh, of hypnosis. You're going to see a whole load of other areas in psychology are explained that hitherto have been inexplicable. We will see that it has an impact in how we actually treat patients, profound impact, and makes it much more effective.